Well, good morning and welcome to worship at Warsaw Presbyterian Church. Good to see everybody here today. I want to remind you that today is communion, so if you didn't pick up your communion cups, they're in the, at, the, at the exits. And um, we will be singing today, but um, please wear your mask if you want to sing, because singing is like the most um, expressive part of, of the germs and stuff. So um, if you would like to sing with us, just be masked on to sing. And with that, let us prepare. Well, let us do the welcoming part. Of the welcoming part so. <laughs> um, just hold on to get through notes with everybody I want to sing. So we don't have a lot of announcements. Okay, we have um, prayer requests. Um, <clears throat> we want to remember Simon, you know, prayer requests. And, um, I, the whole Miller family, I think, Joyce and, and Paul have had a hard time, and she uh, tested me this week and said, put Keith and Sally on the prayer list as well. So, and uh, we remember all of those who, who mourn today. Um, still, losses. Um, and that would be the, the Kerr family and um, Margaret's family as she's lost a cousin and the family of mm -hmm. Richard Mulch. Are there other prayer requests that we'll want to add on there later? Um, and then, are there any announcements that we need to, to highlight? No? Okay. Well, then let's sing Happy Birthday to the late young.
We lift us on this big step of our awakened journey to the cross. Open our hearts, discipline our will. Teach us to follow your perfect ways. Lord, test us with your righteous decrees. Cleanse us from unholy living and turn us toward your holy light. Amen. Okay, please join me to the call of worship. Come all who are searching for life. God calls to you. Lord, us from our selfish habits. We stand in need of the presence of God. Our lives can so easily become corrupted by our own greed. But the Lord has heard our cries and calls us forward on this journey. Lord, that ourselves. Come, let us worship God who is always with us. Let us open our hearts to healing, restoring, and love of God. Amen.
Sisters, here today to rejoice, you are forgiven. Let us hear the clutter of your life, let that fall away, and let it be replaced by the love of God in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven people, thanks be to God. And as a people who are forgiven and who are confident in the peace that Christ gives when we're forgiven, let us share the peace with one another. Peace of Christ be with you. to hear the sounds of your voices, even muffled, even softly. It was beautiful to hear the sounds of the people singing. Okay. All right, do we want to do the quarters? Do you guys want to do the quarters? Do we have the quarters on? I think they're, are they in the basket here? They're in the basket here. So, yeah. We, We've changed the way we have to do the borders during the pandemic, so you, you'll have to come around that way. Uh, or you can go into the board so, yeah. so instead of going all the way around and collecting the borders now, um, we use the borders. People put the borders in on their way out, and then next week, those are the ones that go in. Everything is a little bit different than it used to be, but we're making it work. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this day with so many things laying claim to our lives, our hearts, and our spirits. Open our ears and our hearts to hear your words of healing love. Prepare us to be faithful disciples for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Barb has our first reading for the morning, Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his kingly work. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its surface to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. 
He says to the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of a honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant born. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thank you, Mark. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been in construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, this image of Jesus isn't usually the one that comes to mind when we close our eyes and we picture the Messiah. You know, we might, we might picture the baby Jesus. We might picture one of the famous paintings of Jesus with the lamb around his shoulders. Or maybe Jesus sitting down and welcoming the little children to him. The welcoming Jesus. The kind Jesus. That's what we usually picture. 
We don't normally picture the angry Jesus. We don't really like anger in our culture. We have some kind of an aversion to anger. And so what we tend to do is we tend to deny it. We tend to set it aside and bottle it up until it just explodes. You see, anger is, is kind of like pain. It's, it's a necessary indication that something is not right. And if you don't deal with it, it just gets worse. You know, if you were to take your pain and put it on a hot stove, you would immediately take it off because it's hot. The pain reminds you to take it off. But if you didn't have that pain, you'd leave it there and the tissue would burn and great harm would come. You might not have the use of your hand anymore. So anger is like that for our emotional life. It's an indication something is wrong and we need to deal with it. And because it's necessary, it can't be dismissed without some kind of repercussion. Jesus is showing us here a justified anger. Not the kind of anger that just is an unhealthy anger that just explodes at every little irritation. That's not what I'm talking about as, as an anger that means well, that's an anger that needs to be dealt with in another way. That's a sign of, of not having to dealt with it in a healthy way. I'm talking about the anger that's justified because something in the immediate moment is wrong. It's because you have been wronged. Because someone has, has damaged you or hurt you or someone that you love. Admitting that, we're, that, that something is wrong is the first step in making it right. First step in either seeking forgiveness or offering forgiveness is the first step in repenting, in turning away from what is wrong toward what is right. And so anger is it's useful, but, but we don't really like to explore it much. It's worth noting here that Jesus only ever gets angry with people who think they have things right. only gets angry with people who aren't admitting that something's wrong. Remember the rich young ruler who asks Jesus, what, what do I need to do to get an eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the commandments. And this young man says, yeah, I've done them all. I got it right. Jesus says, no, you lack one thing. You don't love your neighbor. He says, go sell it and you have to give it to the poor. But remember also that Jesus, when asked what's the most important thing, and he says, love God with everything that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all of the law and the prophets. And so when he tells that young man, keep the law, that's what he's saying. Love God and love your neighbor with everything that you are. But this young man thought, I got it right. I followed all the rules. So Jesus gets angry when we try to set grace aside and earn our way to God. In this text, the people, the whole town of Jerusalem is preparing for the Passover, actually the whole, the whole nation of Israel. They're coming to Jerusalem. And so this text describes the temple during this time of preparation. Just like Lent is the season for our preparation for Easter, we, we kind of do some special things. The Jews, they, they traveled to Jerusalem early so that they could get themselves purified for the Passover. And we, you know, we practice meditation or prayer or participate in worship in different ways throughout Lent. So Jesus travels to Jerusalem because it's Passover. And like the other pilgrims, he comes to the temple. The merchants are bustling with their animals, and the money changers are exchanging their coins, and all of the pilgrims who come to town are shopping and looking at what the wares are for sale, and they're bartering with the tradespeople. They're seeking out the priests to, to complete their sacrifices so they can be purified. Now this is different than what we do, but we can kind of identify when we try to get right, when we try to get things right, 
before we come to the Lord. We try to earn it. We try to get ourselves right before we seek God's deliverance and we seek to honor God through our rituals and our, and our repentance. And rather than praising the people for that, seeking to get right, Jesus goes into a rage. He creates his own whip. He chases out the animals. He sends the merchants after them. He pours out the coins and turns over the tables. He tells the dove sellers, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house an emporium. He turns this place of ritualistic purification into a chaos. With people screaming and running, wild animals going, going out, out of their pens, running through the temple. Why would Jesus stop their purification rituals? And why would he do it in such an impure way? In verse 16, Jesus calls the temple an emporium or marketplace rather than a scene of spiritual preparation. You see, Jesus sees this place that is focused more on money than on preparation of the spirit. It's focused more on wealth than on prayer. When Jesus says, stop making my father's house into a marketplace, the disciples remember Psalm 69. It says, zeal for your house will consume me. And so they see in that moment, rather than a maniac coming to disrupt worship, they see him as the righteous sufferer of the psalm. Praising God in song, the psalmist says, is more valuable than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. Praising God with a song from your heart is more valuable than having the most perfect unblemished animal for sacrifice. You see, like, like Jesus, the psalmist has this different understanding of how one is to prepare for a holy day. The rituals and sacrifices should be done out of true devotion to the Lord. But aren't these rituals and sacrifices prescribed in the Old Testament? They are. And so is the Sabbath. And we just read in the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath is prescribed to keep, keep the Sabbath holy. But remember what Jesus says when he and his disciples are chastised for picking grain on the Sabbath? He says to the religious leaders, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made to remind men and women of the holiness of God. And if it doesn't remind us of that, it is no good. The rules are there for our benefit to help us worship sincerely. Not because God needs something from us, but because we need to connect with God. My daughter texted me this week. She said, I'm mad that changing out of my pajamas into real clothes when I work from home actually does make me more productive. After this year of so many disruptions and so many people having to work from home, we, we have realized this truth that sociologists have been telling us for years. You actually are more productive when you go through the motions and taking your work seriously, like getting up and getting dressed, putting shoes on. Going through the motions of taking something seriously prepares us to take it seriously. So why would we not take seriously the preparations to approach the Holy One? 
not because God needs it done that way, but because we do. Because we need to be reminded of the holiness of God. Because you see, the only thing that makes Jesus angry is when we try to sidestep grace and earn our way. When we try to earn our way to God thinking that we get brownie points for doing everything right, for being more productive, for getting everything exactly in the right place and at the right time, for jumping through the hoops. Oh. When we go through the trouble of getting up and getting dressed, of planning a service, of getting the communion wares out, of getting ready for all of this. We're preparing ourselves to be connected to the Holy One. But if we just focus on those physical attributes and the ritual that we practice, and we try to do everything just right, we risk missing out on seeing God standing right there in our midst. Like the Jerusalem leader, Jerusalem leaders, that they worry about the fate of the temple when the Holy One is standing right before them. We find out that the temple that they're worried about, it will be, it will be destroyed in a few years. But the temple of which Jesus speaks is the temple of his own body. You see, when they take it too literally about the walls around them, they miss the deeper meaning of the temple of Christ who replaces the access to God. The people no longer need to come to the building. Jesus is the temple. And so as we walk through the path to Jerusalem during Lent, and we go through our rituals. We join crowds of pilgrims from millennia, preparing for festivals and remembering God's salvation. But we need to remember why we're doing it. Not so that we can get perfect, but because God is perfect. We should be careful that we do not miss God's earth-shattering word right here among us. Rather than coming to a physical temple or a church building, we need to come to the grace that is offered through Jesus Christ. Worship in spirit and truth wherever we are. Wherever we are, with whomever we're with, wearing whatever we're wearing. We worship in spirit and truth, and we seek God's glory by remembering that God's love is made manifest in Jesus Christ. And God's love is made manifest in Christ most obviously when he totally disrupts our plans. And disrupts our plans and sometimes brings us to our knees and sometimes brings us to our feet with joy. Those are the times when we are worshiping the spirit and in truth. And all of our plans and all of our preparation, when they prepare our hearts to see Jesus, are so well worth it. So let us this season of life prepare our hearts for the Holy One who is perfect and assures us that we, we need not be perfect to come to find the grace of Christ. Amen.
have difficulty hearing the story of Jesus cleansing the temple of those who would lie and cheat and steal. We always want Jesus to be patient and meek and mild, but there are many times when bold action is required to cleanse the cancer of greed and avarice from our lives. Lord, help us to remember that Jesus' patient words often fell on deaf ears. Remind us that we need to be bold in our faith. First, examining our lives and clearing out the pain and greed and fear. Replace our anxieties with confidence in your all-sustaining love and grace. Lord, we lift up today those things that weigh heavy on our hearts. We lift up those who mourn. We lift up those who have fear about the coming days. We lift up those who struggle with health issues. God, hear our prayers for them and for us. Lord, we lift up those whose names we do not know, but whose pain we see. Lord, enable us, enable us to put our service to you and your people first. Help us to reach out to others in need and remind us that we all stand in need of your mercy. We ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. And we continue, continue in prayer as we celebrate communion together. The table, the table of bread and wine is now to be made ready. This is the table of company with Jesus and with those who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world, with whom Jesus identifies. It is the table of communion with the earth in which Christ is made incarnate. So come to the table, all of you, all of you who would like to know Jesus more. Come to the table, you who have been here often, and you who have not been here in a very long time. Come to the table, all of all who have carried our wounds and all who have hurt us. 
Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, we pray as he taught us, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive our debtors. And it is not our temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. God has given a fountain of good gifts that are bestowed upon all of us. And we respond to that, to these gifts, by returning a portion of the resources as a sign that all of who we are is a gift from God. We celebrate those gifts now. In the dog's heart. Now, brothers and sisters, as you go out into the world, remember that the love of God is a gift to you, and it will sustain you. And as you go about your business in the week, remember that the life of Christ is a model for us to follow. Let it embolden you and guide you. And as you go through, through your life this week, in those moments when you may feel alone or lost, remember that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is always with you. And in the fellowship of that Spirit, the Holy Spirit will keep us together until we meet again. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.